The operator of the crippled Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant says its water decontaminating system has suffered another setback. Tokyo Electric Power Company says water used to wash contaminated equipment overflowed in the Advanced Liquid Processing System, or ALPS, on Wednesday. TEPCO says workers discovered the problem while washing a tank used for filtering radioactive substances. The utility says more than 1,000 liters of water overflowed and is now within a barrier inside the ALPS building. The firm says the water contains 3.8 million becquerels of beta-ray emitting materials such as strontium and 6,700 becquerels of cesium-137. The company says workers are safe from the overflow. It is investigating the cause of the accident. TEPCO says ALPS can remove most radioactive substances from water at the plant. Test operations started last year, and full-fledged use was scheduled to begin this month. But the system has been plagued with technical difficulties, forcing it to be shut down frequently. All officials have been ordered to strengthen safety measures at the Fukushima plant. This comes after the company announced on Monday that workers had pumped radioactive water into the wrong building. Workers have been injecting water into the damaged reactors to cool the melted nuclear fuel. The resulting highly radioactive water is then supposed to be sent to storage buildings before being decontaminated. However, TEPCO officials say about 200 tons of water was mistakenly pumped into the basement of a building at the compound. They say the water was directed by four pumps meant for emergency use. The commissioner of the Nuclear Regulation Authority, Toyoshi Fuketa, says TEPCO must take stronger measures. He suggested setting up security cameras and locking the pump's switch boxes. The regulator has ordered the utility to come up with preventative measures by Friday. Fuketa also asked for a brief of TEPCO's investigation of the inappropriate transfer. Instagram, the first network to qualify. Vice President signed up and posted his first image today, though the first pick is actually from his office staff and not Biden himself. Biden will be. Japanese authorities lifted earlier this month an evacuation order on part of the restricted zone around the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. Officials say they've completed the decontamination of that particular area. But concerns remain over the impact of radiation. Most residents have yet to return and those with children face tough decisions about their future. <laughs> School children are back in Miyakoji for the first time in three years. The district is part of the municipality of Tamura. It straddles the 20 kilometer restricted zone. 3,000 people used to live here until the nuclear accident. Crews spent months decontaminating roads and ditches. They paid special attention to the areas near schools. Taiga Yamanaka and his family are happy to be home after spending years in cramped temporary housing. But Taiga is a bit disappointed. The number of pupils at his school has decreased by two-thirds three of his closest friends are no longer around. I wanted to be with my buddies again. Some residents fear the government may have failed to clear all radiation hotspots. Taiga's mother is among them. 
ないがあったり沢内りっていうのはんで触るのかな多分放射線分かる放射線うん女性をしたとはいえやっぱ We've been told this area has been decontaminated But I'm not 100% relieved. Still, I think people need to come back to allow the municipality to recover. Three quarters of Miyakochi's residents have yet to return. Naomi Munakata shares a temporary housing unit with her husband and their two daughters. The situation hasn't been brought under control yet. We keep hearing about new problems at the nuclear plant. The couple hesitated about what to do next, but they decided to follow their eldest daughter's wish. I'm so happy to be back at my school. Ayano wakes up an hour earlier every morning to catch the school bus to Miyakoji. She travels 20 kilometers. Her parents aren't convinced letting her go was the right decision. I'm happy because Ayano has been looking forward to this, but we'll have to see how it goes. Some parents in Miyakoji want the government to keep decontaminating the area. They're hoping to minimize their children's exposure to radiation and see them reunite with a few more friends. Some historians believe a treasure trove of documents are hidden in homes across Japan. They think nearly a billion artifacts could be collecting dust and are in danger of being lost forever. One man is now trying to save them with the help of some unusual equipment. Old Japanese documents are written on washi paper made from a mixture of bark fiber and water. Some are hundreds of years old. Passing time and neglect have made them difficult to read. One man has come up with a low-tech way to save these important records. A vacuum cleaner, an electric blender, and lots of patients. These are the tools used by Teruhiro Tani in his mission to preserve the old documents. A former Japanese history professor he has seen many cases of people throwing away documents because of the restoration cost. There are many local families who keep records dating back centuries. Often the documents have been left to molder in a forgotten corner of old storehouses and are badly damaged by the damp or from mice droppings. First, Tani separates the pages carefully, one at a time, using a palette knife. Then he uses a toothbrush to remove the surface dirt. The next step is to repair the holes where the washi paper has decayed. Tani cuts up washi paper into small pieces and mixes them up with water and glue in a blender. He pours this liquid over a page of the old document. This is where the vacuum cleaner comes into play. The water is sucked out. Tani has placed cloth under the document to soak up the moisture. The washi fibers left on top seal up the holes perfectly. In just three hours the documents have become legible. Keeping the cost down is essential. Tani paid less than $2,000 to put his equipment together. A specialist restorer would charge 10 times as much or more. People don't know what to do with their records, so they burn them or throw them out. But as you see, it's easy to restore them by yourself. One of the documents that Tani saved turned out to be a very valuable historical record. It was a daily record written by a local merchant about 160 years ago. It describes what happened when the region was hit by significant earthquakes. In the document, it says the aftershocks continued for four months. This fact was unknown before. The journal is now being kept in the local museum. Officials say documents like this often contain vital information about geological weaknesses in an area. The data could be used to plan for future disasters. 
We need to draw on this information to review our existing planning. Is it safe to have shelters there or hospitals there? Tani wants to get people to join in his efforts, so he's begun organizing workshops on how to preserve old records. The response has been strong. For the first session, twice as many people applied for the 12 places available. It's exciting to find out more about the documents that are hidden away around our town. I want to support Mr. Tani's work. I believe it's our responsibility to pass on our historical records to future generations. Documents like these hold vital messages. The key is to get the local people involved. Tani says old documents are a crucial link to people's local culture and identity. He'll continue his work to preserve that record one page at a time. Here's today's final thought, and it's a serious one. Michael Rupert was a fine broadcaster, researcher, interviewer, buster of myths. He took on big stories, big people, and regularly nailed them. Michael went further into conspiracy theory than I do, and I could not follow him there, but we found plenty to agree upon when it came to the nuclear issue. He produced and hosted the Lifeboat Hour on PRN, and I was honored to be his guest on the show on March 16, only four weeks ago. Last Sunday, April 13, after he finished his broadcast, he went home and shot himself to death. Apparently, it was a planned event to end his life, the culmination of the weight of what he knew, what he shared, and the darkness that came over him never left. He posted his farewell on Facebook, which I now read. He said, I pray to all things seen and unseen, known and unknown, for we are all one. The prophecies are being fulfilled. The hour of birth is at hand. The waters break and rend. There is blood. There are screams of pain. There is death and much anxiety in the air. Things look very bad for our mother and all of her children. The truth awaits just on the other side of the ever-dissolving veil where all the screaming and the mess is going on. The truth opens its arms wide to lovingly receive the newborn and to comfort it. Isn't it wonderful, the truth exclaims? I am your scout, and this is my report. Rest in peace, Michael Rupert, and my condolences to all the people who loved him. This is a tough battle in which we are engaged, one that can wear us down to our souls. So I encourage you to go outside and hug a tree, or stay inside and hug someone you love. Be kind and gentle with yourself, and no matter how annoyed you get with others within our movement, or how much you disagree with them, do not attack. We can all find ourselves in a fragile state, and when we're there, it does not take much to inflict real damage. So take care with yourself and with others as we fight for what we believe. And Michael, wherever you are, we can use all the help you're capable of sending our way. Safe journey. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, April 15, 2014.